I think our time has come to start, so I'd like to start off by welcoming all of you there, or there, here, um, kind of thing. My name is uh, Al Heron. I'm the mayor of the town of Eston, and uh, I'm going to be your chair plus a presenter uh, at, at this particular session. Just a couple of things. Um, we're supposed to advise you that the session is being recorded. And because of that, if you have a question, and there will be time for questions, we'd like you to use the microphone so that uh, at the end of the day, this goes on the website, and you'll be able to take it off if there's something you wanted to reference or if you wanted to hear it again that kind of thing, so it's important that that happens. Um, it'll be on the website too but, uh, during the week of uh, February the 16th. Um, this session is, um, oh, says pumping up, pumping youth up, engagement with council. And <clears throat> Uh, I think it's, I've uh, uh, got to make sure I, I don't miss anything. I guess one of the other things that is important, if the sirens go off, as you heard this morning, it's time to get out of the building, we've got to go kind of thing. But uh, staff will help anybody who is, um, has a gimpy leg like my wife has. Um, <laughs> She's on crutches right now. Anyway, um, and the, when I say the staff, I'm referring to the staff of the, the center here, um, that kind of thing. Uh, so we'd just leave in an orderly way and would tell you when it's, we should go. Going on, um, got to make sure I cover everything here. Uh, just a brief introduction to our of our presenters, uh, John Answen, who's the mayor of the town of Kindersley. It's like he's our sister community. Um, we do a lot of things back and forth. And uh, Tom comes from uh, the town of uh, Larange, way up north. Um, the thing that's significant about Tom, when he was elected mayor, he was the youngest mayor ever to be elected in Saskatchewan. And it's really fitting in a way that uh, he's here today because he's still a young guy. <laughs> and our last presenter at the far end is uh, Tasha. And I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name, but uh, Tasha comes from FCM. She's um, involved with uh, uh, community f facilitation and s stuff, and we'll let her explain that a little bit more when she comes. Coming back to uh, my part, uh, and, and, and the first question you have to ask, well, why would you get youth involved? Why do you want to get youth involved? If you look at the color of my hair, who's going to take my place? And really, that's what it's all about. We want to get young people uh, taking part. I should say we. I want to. I don't know what these guys are going to tell you. Um, and, and, and it's important that um, uh, we give them that chance to develop and become useful citizens in our community. Now, I'd like to share with you a couple of examples of um, what has happened because we've had a, a youth sitting at our council table in Eston. And we've been doing this now for uh, just a little bit over 10 years. And uh, so each year we get a different young person. 
Sometimes we've had two people, they're shy and don't want to come alone, so we've encouraged them to have two. Um, what one of the, in the early years, oh, this is about six, seven years ago, we have a, a track in town that the motocross people um, use, and there's people on that from 12 to about 30 years of age. And because at 12, they're not thinking about, I have to be responsible for something. And the 30-year-olds, if we don't have to do anything, that makes it easy kind of thing. So um, the problem here was, all right, what's town council going to do with it when, um, if we have an accident, who's responsible, all of the little things like that. So um, in a discussion at our town council meeting about it, our youth counselor said, well, I could get the names of everybody, and we didn't know who all was using it. And <clears throat> we thought there was about 10 or 15, but anyway, when she did her research, she came back to us with a list of 30, I think it was 32, something like that. So double the amount that we knew about. Um, we had her then uh, come with us to a meeting with the young people that were using the, the motocross track, plus their parents. And um, we had a meeting about the responsibility, like we were basically asking them to have an organization so that um, the insurance, the, the rules about how it was going to be used could be enforced, all of that kind of stuff. Anyway, it ended up that um, because of the help of our youth counselor, we ended up with a, a, a really good motocross group. They then brought a provincial competition to our community and, and uh, everything really worked out well. All the young people were able to keep the track, that kind of thing. My second example uh, started out with bullying at the school and in the community as a problem. And this is about three years ago, roughly. Anyway, the, the school principal and community, school community group um, had two community meetings about it. Um, from those two meetings, there was a, a committee of young people set up, uh, two or three adults, and the RCMP were part of it. Um, so from those meetings, they came, they came to the school, um, and it was the two young people that were the youth representatives on our council. They brought the principal, one other adult, and the RCMP, and, and uh, we had them introduce, because everybody knows everybody in a small community, but they introduced um, the, the visitors that we had to the council table, and um, they presented uh, this issue of bullying in our community and what could council do about it. They knew full well that we could pass a bylaw if council desired, desired that. Anyway, <clears throat> our youth council spoke to uh, council about the problem and um, would we be helpful in, in, in looking at this situation. To make a long story short, after the, that presentation, our town administrator um, was able to secure a bylaw from a community in uh, Alberta. I don't remember the name of it, but it was a community similar size to what we were. They then, uh, he, got, he got information from Regina and Saskatoon councils through their legal departments about what they were doing. And from all of that, we uh, developed a bylaw. We then took the bylaw back 
to another community meeting. Everybody was comfortable with it. And we ended up passing it. And this is really, I'm talking now about all the stuff that the council did, but the important part about this whole process, um, we, we then as a council submitted this to uh, the community, uh, what are those awards that are coming tomorrow? John, do you remember? What are they called? Anyway, they're SARM and, and SUMA have these awards that are given to a community that supposedly does something really good. Um, and what happened uh, after we passed the bylaw, and, and I should say it's not to stop bullying, it can't, but what it does, it's an educational tool, and if we use it as an educational tool to make people aware how important it is, then uh, a community, I think, grows. The real interesting part was um, because we had uh, won this award, uh, there was a video company came out to um, video our community to interview the RCMP, the youth members, and this kind of thing. And where I really saw two young people grow from this high to way up here was the way they handled themselves in that interview. Um, I, I couldn't believe they were the same kids that I see every day on the street, but they just did a fantastic job of maturing and growing and saying how important it was that, that people had to respect each other and this kind of thing. And it was, it was just a, a wonderful situation. We also, um, after the um, award ceremonies and stuff here in, in uh, I think it was Regina where we received it, um, we took a, the video and the award back to Eston, had a, an assembly of the school people all together and they could see the video and whatnot and the presentation and um, we used it as a tool to uh, show to the, all the young people if something really bothers you that you can do something. They admit uh, were the force that made this happen and um, congratulated them for, for doing it. The, um, the, one of the other interesting things that at the school assembly, the uh, federal minister of, uh, he was not a minister, federal member um, happened to be in Eston this day and uh, he was able to speak to the young people and um, it was Mr. Anderson from Swift Current. No, that's not where he's from. Anyway, from that constituency and um, he congratulated the students. So this was sort of another thing he, he was hearing from another level of government. What, do, <clears throat> what does the program cost us to have youth involved? We pay them uh, per diem if they come to a council meeting. They don't always come because they might have a hockey game, they might have basketball. Um, their lives are taken up with events such as we as adults. Uh, anyway, the, um, uh, we pay them $20 a meeting when they come to our council meeting. Uh, it, we tell them it's for the gas that they use to, to come to our meeting and take part. The other <coughs> uh, third example that I wanna share with you, our Communities in Bloom Committee um, decided that Eston should have a, an urban forest and um, about Four years ago now, I guess it was, or maybe five, um, we had a session where um, we had a whole bunch of trees to plant. We got a, a grant from, uh, uh, it wasn't Nikon, but it was Canon, 
um, they were offering, uh, if you would plant trees in your community, a grant, and we got $5,000 from them, and we spent it all on trees. And, um, of course, when all the trees come, it was uh, quite a load, and like there was about 300 trees uh, that we were able to purchase. Anyway, uh, now how are we going to get all these in the ground? So as a youth project, we had our youth go to the school and sell everybody on the process that they would get a day, half a day off of school if they'd come and help plant all these trees. Uh, the interesting thing about that, that um, what it did, it, 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 uh, by, in addition to having the kids uh, plant all the trees, and each kid, uh, the majority of them were able to plant at least two trees, um, it gave them a respect for the area that we normally might not have gotten. And uh, it was kind of interesting because we had the 220 uh, students and 15 teachers all there planting trees. And uh, it was fun to see the little gaffers that were eight, nine years old carrying an ice cream pail full of water. It was just about their limit, because that's about almost 10 pounds. And uh, it was just a, gr a great day. We've had uh, a youth counselor now for about 10 years. Um, it, it's good, it, depending on the kid and the kid, the young person, I should say, uh, and their, what their involvements are as to how often we get them to our council table. And it, it's, uh, it's been very worthwhile. It's, it's great to see them develop. And uh, I, some of them will be future leaders, not all. But if we give them that experience and exposure to our, our council tables, I think the dividends are great. I'm going to stop there. And uh, our next speaker is John Enswin, who is the mayor of Kindersley. John? Thanks, Hal. Uh, I should preface everything by saying that um, I'm on both sides of the table on this. Uh, as mayor with a youth council, and we have a youth council of uh, seven young people, uh, one mayor and six councillors, but also uh, my oldest son, was first a councillor on our youth council, and then last year he was elected mayor by the council. So it was, a, it was a tremendous privilege. So I've got a seat on both sides of the table here on what goes on and listening to him come home and talking with him about these things. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I just want to preface with that. Our youth council started in 2009 as a result of a strategic planning process where youth engagement was identified as a need. And the youth targeted in Kindersley was those in grades 8 through 10. So they come in in grade 8, they're a counselor. Grade 9, they can become a mayor or counselor. And then in grade 10, uh, we actually, uh, ones who have been really involved and dedicated, uh, they go on to be the CAO of the youth council. So you have a grade 10 student, grade 11 students, uh, who've been CAO doing some of the administrative work. And I'm going to talk about some of the changes, but we've been able to partner with the school as well, so that uh, the youth council and the CAOs can end up getting a credit in the high school. And uh, it ties into some of their social uh, studies uh, things. Um, so they have a direct line to council. We've had them sit at the table. Initially, when I became mayor, I really wanted to have youth council sit around the council tables, table with us. Um, but I think all of you can appreciate that sometime the dynamic around the table may not be appropriate when you're trying to develop young leaders. And uh, based on that, in the first year, I was very hesitant to do that. I think we did it once. Last year, we did it once. And uh, this year, uh, we've changed the time frame for the youth uh, to, uh, with, for the, with the alignment with the school. And they're just going through some of their preliminary training before they come around the table. Uh, back in the day, 2009, when it started, it took them about three months. OK, we're going to do it. Let's do it. And uh, the, the thrust was that, you know, council would act as mentors. I know my son came and talked to me about some of his things, but not everybody's, you know, not every son has a dad or a mom who's married to talk about. 
And uh, it's a council resolution. They have their own budget item in the, or budget line in the budget. And, uh, and it's basically, we give them $7,500. And they have to allocate the resources according to their own priorities. We don't tell them what they have to spend it on. We don't tell them what they have to do. They determine their own, um, their own priorities. However, from a governance perspective and working with user groups around the community, sometimes there's a fudgy line between, yeah, that's a good thing that you're doing, and child exploitation. So that's one of the things we have to kind of keep an eye out because groups will phone them up and say, hey, we need volunteers. And uh, you know that's great, um, but they also have their own priorities, they have their own lives. The unfortunate thing that we've seen so far, and we're trying to get away from it, and it is challenging, is that the leaders on the Student Leadership Council, the leaders in the different groups, are also the ones who want to be part of the Youth Council. And that's terrific that these people are engaged and they want to do stuff. But the unfortunate thing is, is you know, what happened with the previous councils, is they started getting like too little butter on too much bread. They get spread too far. And it's not really effective for them, and it's not effective for what council wants to accomplish. So our new coordinator is Michelle. It's one of the things she's trying to identify is, what are their engagement with other uh, groups around the school and things like that? Because if you're on Student Leadership Council, you know what, you have obligations there. My son and uh, mem many members of the last council, Student Leadership Council, a band leader, and all these things, and they can only do so much. So that was um, one of the things I've talked about, getting more engaged in the school. It's the school credit. Uh, the SAS, uh, our MLA is Bill Boyd with the SAS party. And this past year, the constituency office said, hey, there's going to be a youth component at the youth convent at the uh, convention. We'd like to send two members of the youth council there. And I said, great. You know what? Exposure. Because being a municipal leader is about nonpartisanship. It doesn't matter who sits in Regina, if it's the NDP or the SAS party, we have to have a constructive working relationship with them to move our agenda forward and to move theirs. So we said, yeah, sure. And then um, the NDP is kind of like an extinct, an extinct species in the Kindersley area. So I, I've gotten to know someone from the NDP and I phoned them up and I said, do you have a youth convention? So they're going to keep the communication open with me so when they have their convention that members of our youth council can go down there. Because I think it's a critical that they learn, <clears throat> doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on, you've got to work with them. And it has to be a constructive relationship. And the, you know, another area that we're looking at improving is more engagement from the school. It's one thing to have people nominated, uh, and then you know, we as counselors and the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, Michelle and then uh, uh, CAO uh, interview them, but what about peer engagement for perhaps selecting them or something like this? So to say that we're set where we're at I think is inaccurate. We're still trying to tweak it and fine tune it to see what's the best fit uh, for, our, uh, for our community. But the other thing is that seasons of youth change. You know what, this, this cohort may be uh, fully engaged doing one thing. Like last year we had 13 applications for seven, no it was more than 13, uh, 19 or 19 applications for seven positions last year. And this year we had six. So, you know, I think one of the keys that we have to remember is that we have to be flexible. And when you're working with teenagers, grades 8 to 10, um, you know what? They don't always make the choices that we think are rational. <laughs> they make choices that, you know, suit their convenience. And, uh, you know, the program has to be a little bit flexible to deal with that. And I know my son complained a couple of times, but, you know, Dad, I've got this band thing I'm supposed to be doing, SLC. Uh, he was involved in one other thing. I can't remember what it was. And then he had um, council. And I said, well, which priority was set first? Oh, because he wanted to pick and choose his favorite. And I said, oh, you have obligations. But anyways, uh, so those are some of the things that we're doing. Now, for success in the community, um, you know, I don't think, I don't believe in cookie cutter templates. You know, I just really don't see that working. You may want to exploit your children differently than we do. Uh, having said that, uh, you need to have consistent engagement from leadership. We have a staff person dedicated. Uh, I'm guessing, Michelle, five, seven hours a week is probably what you do? Um, okay, up to 10 hours a week. Uh, you need that commitment. Um, but we're working, like she goes through 
um, governance training with them, goes through the Roberts Rules of Order, uh, talks about how bylaws are done, uh, and talks about strategic planning, setting priorities, what are the values that you work with. You know, they're given a lot of tools to work with. And uh, so it takes a bit of time and it takes a bit of dedication. We really appreciate what Michelle's been doing for the last six to eight months and Wayne before that. Um, you know, myself and council, and that can be tough. Commun uh, Kindersley's been booming and, you know, we run flat out. I'm supposed to be part time and I put in about 30 hours a week. And then you want to put students on top of that, but you still need that commitment. And, um, <clears throat> the, and getting back to just teenagers, you know, this is a stage in life where they're going through a lot of physiological changes and it affects them emotionally and intellectually. And we just need to be flexible and nimble in working with them. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the next thing let's talk about, what's the role of uh, the youth coordinator, who's Michelle? Michelle's at the front here if you want to talk with her later. And um, uh, so this is just one, like I said, it's about 10 hours a week. She looks after uh, culture and heritage for us. And uh, she oversees the structures, does the facilitating, you know, uh, she probably spends probably an hour or two a week just trying to herd them into one time for a meeting. Uh, and you can imagine teenagers being like that. And um, yeah, so I, that's about all I have to say. I've kind of rushed through it, realizing that there's uh, a lot to be said yet. Um, but it's important that they come up and that they participate in council. Uh, fundamentally, what our group is transitioning from is being event planners like um, tidy week, getting people to clean up uh, the community in time for communities in bloom. Uh, they host our Canada Day celebration. Uh, they also do a drive-in theater uh, in the summer. Uh, so they're doing event planning, but we like them to be able to be a little bit more engaged from what do we need from a community, from a council policy perspective that we can equip them to do or that they can form us uh, to better serve their residents in Kindersley. So I'll turn it back to Al, or you want to pass it on to yeah. Tom? Yeah, that's good. So. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, John. And we'll go to Thomas as the next one, and he wants to come and stand up. I hope you guys will forgive us because we've been sitting for a long time. I like to stand this way. I can look into Darren Hill's eyes in the corner there and everyone watching. Uh, Michelle, I'll probably come see you because the Roberts Rule of Orders, things like that. For me, I should probably learn that a little bit more. Uh, but it is a pleasure to be here. It's very exciting to be part of the youth aspect on what needs to take place in the province of Saskatchewan in order to move our municipalities forward by having young people engaged. And what I kind of plan on talking about is a little bit how I got involved in municipal politics, kind of the things we're doing for outreach with the young people in our community, and finally just a little bit of tips for moving forward if, if, if you have any young people in your communities that are considering politics into the future. I was lucky enough to be born and raised in La Ronge, and at 18 I was elected as a councillor. I served for three years and at 21 in 2009 I was elected mayor of La Ronge and subsequently re-elected in the last municipal election. When I was elected mayor it was a very uh, steep learning curve and at that time our council was also fairly young with four members under the age of 35, one close to 40 and two just a little bit older at 50. And they're right in the front so I have to just smile correctly at that. However, that dynamic gave us the opportunity to learn but also the dynamic to have people that sat at the council table prior to provide some leadership into the next phase of what we wanted to accomplish in our community. So one of the first projects that I took on as when I became a councillor was simply a youth oriented project with the LaRange Skateboard Park. Many communities have the issues of young people skateboarding in areas where perhaps they shouldn't be, but unless we give them a place to go, it's very difficult to enforce bylaws and move forward on things that we should be in the community. So as I move forward, I learned soon that council is a game of compromise, of working with people rather than against, and to ensure that if you do have a project identified, that as young people, you come to the table and share your story. When we did move forward on the actual skateboard park issue, we had many young people come to council, provide statistics, provide opportunities, and things that council actually won us over. And the deputy mayor there sitting in the front row was actually, I wouldn't say a proponent of the skateboard park, however, in turn, 
she identified issues that we had to work through and with the guidance of people that actually understood that there are challenges to any project moving forward, we were able to successfully get her on side and get the project done. As a mayor, currently as a young person in the community growing up, you know a lot of people, so it becomes very easy to go out and discuss different things, see what their opinions are on different issues. However, the three-point kind of plan that I had with young people, and the council has been doing as well, is one, social media. Facebook and Twitter, although can be fairly challenging at times, is your absolute must to engage young people moving forward. Messaging needs to be on key, there needs to be, of course, some discussion, but discussion that's positive, always outlining that if a discussion perhaps is getting a little heated or off track, come see us in the office. But sharing that information, because young people are far more willing to strive through their Facebook or Twitter and identify what's important rather than actually going to the town office and looking through minutes, or even going online and looking through minutes. Second of all is actually doing school trips and school tours. I identified several classes that I would, grade seven, eights, nines, and tens, that I go into the school regularly each year, have a sit down, have coffee with the students, discuss what the municipality is doing, what their future looks like, what they would like to see in the community, and of course, what they can offer to the community. It's about them making contributions to our community and seeing that they can be part of the change. And finally, the third one, being very simple at all, is actually having that inviting that inviting, I guess, aspect to providing programming that young people actually want to take part in. The reason I got involved in municipal politics at 18 was that I was part of a junior firefighter program that the town of LaRange offered. The fire chief and deputy fire chief had instilled it. At that time, they were looking at perhaps some funding or liability issues, and we were driven because we cared about the program, we cared about giving back to the community, and we cared that the program continued. And at that point, I had to reach out, had to talk to various counselors, making sure that the program went further. So if you do have junior firefighter programs in your community, I stress them, junior response. It gives young people that actual buy into the community and realize how important they are. Finally, some tips. As a young person, at times you can be seen, do you actually belong in the position that you are in? As a young person becoming mayor at 21, and I hate to say this term, but the Old Boys Club is in every community and is a very strong group of people that have that long-term knowledge of the community, which you can use, but also have those preset notions that young people perhaps don't belong in the positions that they are striving for. So it took some time to win over the Old Boys Club. Still haven't won them all over, but we're still working on it. But it's making sure as a young person, you do it 120%. And if you are a young person, don't expect just because you're young and there's an opportunity to be on a youth council that it may be just for you to be there. You have to put in the 120% to prove to yourself and prove to the others that you belong there. Also, as a young person, it's about respect. We have a unique dynamic at our council now as the previous mayor has been elected to council. So he served 12 years as mayor. I took over. He's back at the council table. The first few months were not the best months. And I myself had an ego on my shoulder. I felt this is my chair, this isn't his chair. But however, we forgot that it's actually about serving the public. And through the time and through the months we've moved on, it's actually beneficial to the community to have that longevity and that information, and it's about utilizing that information. So it's about respecting one another, ensuring as a young person you respect those people around you on council, and ensuring long term that you have that collective vision to move your community forward. I enjoy politics. There are days where I probably make huge mistakes. Uh, there are times we make tough decisions, such as water and sewer rates. Some of you may have heard that LaRange did some astronomical water and sewer rates because we haven't raised rates. Those things weigh you down. However, it's about serving the community and making changes. And I, I'm happy to report that I'm still enjoying politics, and I look forward to the next provincial election as a candidate, and just getting those ideas about young people and about things that we can collectively do. So thank you. What a great example. Thanks very much, Tom. Now, our, ne our next presenter will be Tasha. I just, Sorry. The, the one thing I should say about Tasha is she's from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and, and uh, 
is her outsider. So it'll be interesting to hear what she's going to tell us about things that we're doing. Go Perfect. for it. Thank you. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, my presentation is divided in three parts. The first part is talking about the Jack Layden Fellowship Program, which was a program that I was a part of at FCM over the summer. The second part is going to discuss um, the Municipal Youth Engagement Handbook that me and six other Jack Layden Fellows created over the summer to increase re uh, recruitment and retention of young professionals in the municipal sector. And then the third uh, section is just a brief uh, outline of my experience working with the community. Okay, so <clears throat> to begin, Mr. Jack Layden was a champion of local politics and believed in the power and potential of local government and continued to fight for these beliefs even after entering federal politics. Mr. Layden was also an active member of FCM where he was a member as a city councillor and later as president in 2001. While at FCM, Mr. Layden pursued and supported the issues that mattered to him most and strengthened FCM's mandate in these, such, oops, such, as, sorry, such as the environment and, uh, and getting young Canadians from all backgrounds involved in local government, something he was personally involved in himself as city councillor in Toronto. So during his two decades dedicated to public service, Mr. Layden believed that ideas, no matter how big or small, are something to be explored, nurtured, and supported, and that grassroots community-based initiatives with proper support can result in real change. Shortly after the passing of Mr. Layden, the 2000, in 2011, the board of FCM decided to establish the Jack Layden Fellowship Program. The fellowship program was created to honor and preserve the late Mr. Layden's legacy of youth involvement in Canadian communities. The board also did this to commemorate and honor Jack's service to FCM as president and as a member. The board decided it was important to continue Jack work, Jack's work with engaging young Canadians and built the fellowship program on the belief that young Canadians have a huge potential in shaping the future of Canada. The, the board of directors were also determined to create a program that would attract young people engage them more deeply in important municipal issues and serve as a means for networking and influencing future municipal leaders. The focus of the fellowship program is on youth action and building municipal interest. The board expressed that there was a need to get young people excited and engaged in building stronger communities all over Canada and believed that the Jack Layden Fellowship Program would be able to foster this growth by creating valuable tools resources and opportunities for young Canadians. The fellowship program also provides an opportunity for a number of community-minded leaders to turn their good ideas into real action and real change. Specifically, the fellowship was created to seed, support and develop good ideas that engage young Canadians in public policy and civic participation at the local level. So since its inception, the Jack Layden Fellows have engaged in a number of initiatives in order to raise awareness and promote youth engagement in local politics, each year focusing on a central theme. The Fellows cre creatively have used a number of mediums such as Twitter, Facebook, blogs, and external partnerships in order to increase their reach and effectively interact with their target audience. The Jack Layden Fellows have also ha participated in a number of opportunities and exciting events such as hosting live tweet chats, attending FCM's annual general meeting where we were able to host a youth workshop and have spoken on a number of panels where they represented a youth voice and were able to connect with like-minded young Canadians from all over Canada. So each year the FCM Board of Directors challenges challenges the incoming Jack Layden Fellows to develop and implement a project intended to improve the state of youth inclusion in local democracy and governance. This past summer, the 2014 Jack Layden Fellows sought to engage young Canadians more directly in their local government with the goal of fostering lifelong spirit of citizenship and interest in local municipal issues. We also sought to address a major issue also identified by the board the recruitment and retention of young professionals. And as a result, the Jack Layden Fellows designed, researched, and put together a toolkit called the Municipal Youth Engagement Handbook, designed for municipal leaders and administrative staff. 
So as I previously mentioned, the Municipal Youth Engagement hand Handbook was developed in recognition of arguably one of the most pressing, is pressing issues facing municipalities today, the recruitment and retention of top young professionals. The immediate need for municipalities to encourage active citizenship among their young residents is made clear by examining the evolving state of the Canadian workforce. According to FCM's report, Canadian Aging, Canada's Aging Population, in 2011, Canada reached a significant demographic milestone as the first of its baby boomer generation turned 65 years of age. According to StatsCan, the, in 2011, one in seven Canadians were 65 years of age or older, and this ratio is expected to grow to one in four by 2036. For the municipal sector, this ongoing demographic shift represents a significant threat to its ability to provide essential services to its citizens. In fact, according to the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators, uh, attracting and retaining qualified employees ranks second only to the economy as a most significant threat to municipal organization sustainability today. Some municipalities expect that 30 to 50 percent of their municipal employees are going to retire within the next five to ten years, and these positions are usually senior experts or positions of management. So these startling facts and a number of concerns expressed by municipal municipalities across Canada resulted in the FCM board's decision to focus the 2014 Jack Layden Fellowship term on the theme recruitment and retention of young professionals in the municipal sector. This theme helped us scope and define our summer term and provided insight into areas of opportunity for youth to be heard by municipal governments and vice versa. So who was part of the Jack Layden Fellowship? This year, it, our program consisted of 16, six, sorry, not 16, six extremely passionate, passionate and talented group of fellows. The first was Stephanie Sokolowski. She was an undergraduate student from the University of Waterloo, where she is studying urban planning and was the Knowledge Services Fellow at FCM. James Bridges uh, is currently completing his Master's in Political Management at Carleton and received his BA in Political Studies from Queens. Over the summer, James was the Policy Research Fellow. Michael Dubois was a Governance Fellow at GMF and completed his BA in English Lit and is doing his Master's in Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. Rebecca Klassen is an undergraduate student at the University of Ottawa completing her degree in International Development and Globalization. She was the Applications Fellow for the Green Municipal Fund at GMF. Uh, next was Claire Boychuk. She has a BA in Geography and is currently completing her law degree at McGill. Over the summer, Claire was working with government and media relations. And lastly, there was myself. I spent the summer as the Green Teen Intern at FCM, where I, and I also completed my degree in International Development Studies and Political Science at York University and recently graduated from my master's program in Environment and Sustainability. So collectively, we worked together in re through research and consultation to create and design the Municipal Youth Engagement Handbook. It was designed to concisely highlight the resources, strategies, and tools that elected municipal officials and public administrators alike can use to address the challenges of engaging with and potentially recruiting these young Canadians as future municipal leaders and employees. Specifically targeting youth aged 14 to 25, the Municipal Youth Engagement Handbook is organized into three different aspects of youth engagement, which can be tailored to your local reality, resources available, and objectives. We developed this handbook understanding that not, that not every municipality has the resources, staff, and capacity to host the same initiatives that a large city such as Toronto is able to do. Therefore, we intentionally made sure that there was a wide spectrum of options that it could appeal to all municipalities depending on their objectives. So this handbook was divided into three sections. Each section has been written extremely straight to the point with real case studies from across Canada and includes a number of extremely useful resources and contacts. So the three sections that we included were educate and inform, engage and participate, and recruit and retain. So the first section, educate and reform, addresses the gap that a, long, a lot of young Canadians do not have a solid understanding of what municipal governments do and the importance that these institutions have on our daily lives. We argue that in order to recruit and retain young professionals, municipalities need to invest in educating their young and informing the public on what municipalities do and what role they play in order to build awareness and general interest in local government. 
So in our, this section, you will find key principles to think about when initiating an educational and or awareness campaign to engage youth. It provides suggested activities and tools such as local government week, student contests, open houses, and the use of social media such as Twitter. Um, and also provides youth organizations to consider reaching out to in order to increase your reach and gain valuable support and resources. And we've provided uh, organizations such as Apathy is Boring and Student Vote. And we also provided best practices for municipalities who have experience in youth engagement. So the next section, Engage and Participate, um, argues that in order to attract the next generation of municipal leaders in your community, young residents have to be engaged in a way that makes them excited, interested, and investing in, invested in the plans and processes that will shape how their community looks like in the future. So in this section, we highlight the benefits and opportunities that youth councils, youth advisory councils, and specifically mandated youth members in municipal council have and can serve as an institutional mechanism to engage young residents. Here we provide how to establish and select youth councils, how to create youth advisory councils, and the process of creating a youth member within municipal council. We have also provided a case study with the town of Peltham, who, have, who has actually created an official youth advisory council who meets with the mayor and advises him on issues that impact youth, as well as hears updates directly from the mayor regarding City Hall's activities. And lastly, the next section is recruit and retain. The objectives of this section is to provide initiatives that will directly attract and recruit top young professionals as well as initiatives that promote career development, encouraging employees to continue employment in the public sector. These in initiatives were identified as highly promising avenues in recruiting and retaining young professionals by a number of professional organizations and associations as well as identified at FCM's AGM. We provide examples and links to resources for the following initiatives, job shadowing, career mentoring, internships, young professional networks, and young professional committees. By implementing these programs, municipalities will be able to create an organizational culture more catered to young professionals and will be better positioned to compete with the private sector despite the differences, the possible differences in wages. This handbook is a great tool for anyone who's looking to increase youth participation and brings a lot of value to municipalities by providing concrete examples, links to resources, and guides on how to get youth engaged, involved, and p passionate about municipal government. So now I'll just talk a little bit about myself. So involvement in one's community is something I've always considered a very important part of active, active citizenship. From a very young age, I was introduced to the important role the importance of being an active member of my community and the benefits that it not only brings myself but to those around me. My father has always played a very active role in the community and continues to be one of my greatest role models. He taught me that no matter your age, capabilities, or education le le level, everyone has something to bring to the table and can, ma can make a positive impact in their communities. So my experience started when I was only six years of age and I began to learn how to play the sport squash. In my hometown of Pickering, Ontario, we have a Pickering Squash League located at our community recreation center. It was there that my love for the city grew as I met people from all walks of life who came together to play squash and support their community. The Pickering Squash Club was more than recreation. It was a family and a group of people who wanted to do more and give back to their city. As a result, we hosted a number of free events for children who were interested in learning the sport campaigned and fundraised for local community initiatives and actually developed a strong relationship with the city's mayors and councillors due to our presence in the community. In high school, I also participated in a number of school groups. I helped found a school group called Assisting Communities Together who were dedicated to giving back to our community. We interacted with a number of local organizations and met with a number of city representatives in order to increase youth involvement in the community and provide support to those organizations who are on the ground level and making a difference in our city. In university, I once again submerged myself in becoming involved. I was a career center ambassador, a student ambassador for my, my faculty, and a Habitat for Humanity volunteer, just to name a few. I, once again, I was reminded of how important the local is and how much a di difference we can make. So looking back at my experiences, a passion was certainly building and is now ingrained in my own personal beliefs and values. I truly believe that if you want to make a meaningful difference and really see change in your community, you have to go to the source. Local governments are at the center of this. 
They are the hearts of our communities. They are responsible for essential services and are directly accountable to the people that they serve. More and more Canadians are coming to realize this reality and beginning to understand that real change and real solutions are found at the local levels with our, with our local governments. Hopefully through programs such as the Jack Layden Fellowship and through this upcoming federal election, we see a change in the na nation's discourse where the importance of municipalities are brought to the front and more and more Canadians chant hometown proud. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha. If you have uh, questions, we're open. And if you have a question, we'd like you to come to the microphone in the aisle there, please. Don't be shy. Rebecca Otitoju from the town of White City. Uh, my question will go to uh, Tasha. I, I want to ask, with the fellowship, do you have uh, funding for municipalities that, let's say, the town of White City, for example, wants to do something with the youth and maybe we need uh, money to be able to do these things? Is this fellowship able to provide that? Apart from the information and the handbook, and your experience that you just explained to us? Unfortunately, no. Our fellowship program is more of an internship program for students to help them develop their skills. Um, what we do is provide resources and contacts to organizations that may support okay. financially and with other resources and even just staff support we've linked in our handbook. So we, although we don't provide funding, we do provide links to places where you can receive that. Okay, thank you. And my next uh, comment, Question since I'm standing here will be to either one of you, the two mayors at the table. Uh, just as she mentioned, her experience from the family, like the, uh, the part that her dad played in letting her know that it's important for you to gi give back to the community. So uh, when you wanted to start the, uh, the youth council, did you consult first with the parents or uh, I know you, so one of you mentioned the school, but how did the parents come into this to get their children interested in this? Uh, thank you. Um, parents are key. You know, s students, children aren't successful enough if they have parental support. And, um, and, and, I, and the parents that I know that I've met, you know, they're, they have to be involved. You know, that's one of the interview questions. You know, what does your family think about this? Things like that. That's critical. Having said that, uh, I was absolutely delighted um, this year. We interviewed all six candidates, and there was uh, one young person who uh, came from a household from that, you know, socioeconomically, they're not engaged. Uh, you know, from the poorer part of town, uh, this young person didn't really have an opportunity to participate in activities because the, the parents didn't have the resources to allow them to do that. Um, but they made a commitment to help this person uh, be a part of council. And I thought that was terrific because we need to reach out to uh, those parts of the community that may not always historically participate. And so that was, you know, to me that, that was the best interview that I had that day. And there were some good ones. And, um, but again, you know, if the parents aren't there helping the students to make decisions, to determine their priorities, like, gee, you know, I'm involved in four different things, which one do I do? Uh, you know, it's not going to succeed. So, yeah. And with the school, uh, again, you know, the, the forms that they have to fill, I had to fill one out for my son for a different matter, and um, it's, it's a parental signature on the bottom of it. So. Okay. Thank, okay. You. Thank you for your questions. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Lance Cornwell, counselor with the town of Strasbourg. Um, first, I have a question for Al. Do you know what age the youngest town administrator has ever been, to your knowledge? 
No, I can't, I can't answer that. Okay. Don't know. I just want to share something with everybody. Um, we went through a, an administrator change uh, about a year ago. Um, we had an administrator quit on us, and we had one girl in the office that was with us a year. Uh, that was the longest serving person in the office when our administrator quit. Um, we had a young girl, I believe she was still 25 at the time. She'd worked for us for one year, and we, the, the council talked about it at the time. Um, we put out a, a call for uh, an administrator and didn't get much for applications. And we, um, we grouply decided to let this young girl take on as administrator with uh, a, men uh, a mentor from a, from a close town. She has absolutely blown us away with uh, what she's capable of. Um, she has a degree in linguistics and she's now got her um, government authority uh, certificate. Um, she still has some hours uh, to finish her mentorship. But I just encourage anybody that if they have young people that are willing to step into that place to give them a chance, uh, she is, like I say, just absolutely blown us away with what she's capable of. Um, gone totally above and beyond uh, as far as keeping us informed with what's going on, with uh, looking after our council meetings and everything, every aspect, um, with being an, a town administrator with virtually zero um, experience. So, thank you. Thank sorry, you. I, sorry, ahead, I just John. want to speak to that. Um, I recently wrote on what I called the impending labor shortage for municipalities. Uh, I believe it was the Pew Research Firm did a study, it's a longitudinal study in the states. And uh, the base date, the, the point to start was 1973 in the survey of college graduates. For that year revealed that 43% of those students would work at any level of government. This is American, federal, state, and local. Now they did another one in 19, uh, 2012. And that number of students willing to work for any level of government was down to 13%. You know, so all of a sudden, instead of having half of a potential labor market that we can recruit employees for, or even engagement, as, as an elected official, has shrunk considerably. And there's a lot of different cultural factors, but I was just blown away when I came across that. Because, you know, us, you know, Kindersley, you know, we're, we're struggling trying to find people. It, we really are, and I, I've talked to a lot of different mayors, and I know everybody is really struggling to find someone. So thanks for bringing it up, but I thought I'd share that with you. It was just mind-blowing when I came across. There. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Heron. And to the council member from White City, just because there's not any flow down, flow down funds from FCM, if you have somebody that is truly a, uh, a a youth that's interested in your community, I encourage you to look up the information for the Jack Layton Fellowship Program and encourage them to apply. I was very proud to be on the FCM Board of Directors when we created that fellowship and uh, if you need any more information, just give me a shout, I'd be happy to help you with that. Uh, your Worships, I had a question. Um, uh, Mayor uh, Sirzaiki mentioned the comment about social media and Mayor Ann Wins, you mentioned a comment about your Youth Council has their own budget. So social media is kind of my question on both of them. Uh, Thomas, do you have somebody that looks specifically after your social media and do you have a, a youth uh, that you consult with that? But you're pretty close to the age category of the, the people you're trying to reach yourself, so. Uh, currently the town of LaRange itself has people that are responsible for our website or our Facebook page. We're not quite on Twitter yet, but as we move forward, we too have a young administrator who's 34 and a deputy CAO who's 38. So we do have a transition in the office, so things are taking a little bit of time to ensure. Uh, I handle my personal media myself. I have a group that I call my uh, backboard that I do send out messages prior to sending them out to ensure that one, it's polite, but two, it's also on message. Because at times, I think as a young person, you tend to probably emotionalize a lot of decisions at times and you do need to take a step back and kind of look at the big picture. Great, thank you. Now that kind of segues into you, uh, Marin Wins. Uh, does your youth council consult on your communication strategy, strategy or do they have their own communication channels? Um, they have 
uh, I'm trying to remember, they have their own Facebook and their own Twitter. Um, and that's delegated. Uh, my son had a period of time where he's responsible right. for sending out garbage tips uh, and different things like that. So it depends on what the activity is and who has the responsibility. So they have the full responsibility for it. Same thing with the budget. We don't tell them what their priorities are. They come up with those and they have to uh, spend accordingly. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Jerry. Next. I just want to thank all three of you for your presentation. I think they were pretty smart and useful. I have a couple of observations I'd like to make. One, anybody who's working with youth, and I do a lot of work with youth, everything from restorative justice to anti-racism to diversity, multiculturalism, all sorts of things. One of the problems I find with young pe adults and young people is that adults don't know how to talk to youth. And uh, when we do talk to youth, we, of, we often come from our own personal perspective. And that perspective blinds us emotionally and intellectually to the perspective of young people, so sometimes they just won't talk. So if you want a resource that might help you, if you need it, is a book, I forget the name of the author, but it's called How to Listen So Children Will Talk and How to Talk So Children Will Listen. It's a useful guide. I. Mayor Heron, and I, I, you, you struck a, a chord in me um, that I'm just going to have to share with you because I have a, a slightly different perspective, not better perspective, but different perspective to something that you said about young people and if they don't listen to their parents, they may not do X, Y, and Z. I'm one of those kids who grew up in Brooklyn, New York, who never listened, actively listened to the adult members of my family. Um, I was a straight A student in school, but on the street I was a gangster. I was a warlord of a very notorious street gang in Brooklyn. Name you don't need to know. I saw friends of mine killed. Others have gone in the electric chair and sin seeing prison and so forth. I never did any of those kind of, I didn't kill anybody so you people can relax. Yeah. All right. <laughs> But I was in the leadership of the organization, and I know guys who did. All right. So <clears throat> what changed me in terms of my gang affiliation was my grandmother. She told me she knew that I was associating with guys that weren't very good. And she was right. I don't know how she found that out. What have you. And she said, that she knew me well enough to know that there was good in me. I had a little question about that, but nevertheless, I listened to her. And she said to me, every person is born with potential. That potential can be curbed by how they are raised within their families, how they're treated in the society that they live in. And folks, I'm not talking about race here, all right? I'm not I'm talking about culture for that matter. I'm talking about being a human being. And she said that, she said, don't let your mind write a check that your body can't cash. In other words, don't let your mind persuade you to do things <clears throat> that you know in your own mind and your heart that you can't do to be truthful to yourself. That's what she told me. Now, I have a lot of guys, friends, mine, what have you, who start out even rougher than I did, what have you. Some run their own businesses and so forth. So my plea to everybody in this room is n not to shy away from whatever difficulties a young person may have, but find ways to reach out to them so that they will respond in a positive way. And therein lies the gem. And if we can do that, then we will have many more young people engaging. That's one thing. The second thing I wanted to raise is this. <clears throat> I don't know if uh, the program has reached out. There's over 100,000 Aboriginal people, kids, young people, and others living in Toronto. And I wonder to what extent has that program that you were describing have reached out to them? I'm not looking for an answer. It's just a question that I have. 
have you listening to everyone speak. The other thing, and the reason for that, is there's a lot of potential there. Tremendous potential. And in my experience, when I go to Toronto and I go and see some of the people that I know and what have you, there is a sense of, um, in some, hopelessness, and others, they're feeling quite good. But if we go to the Indian Friendship Center and talk to people and meet those young people who, outside of that particular milieu, might be seen as troubled kids, because there are troubled kids there, so they all get painted with the same stroke of a brush, what have you. But we reach out to them and find that there are those gems there that can make positive contributions so forth if they're receiving the same, the kind of training that they need to receive. So that's my message to you, to take that back to your community there and see if there's something they can do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You were very lucky to have a good grandma. Any more questions? If not, I'd like to uh, thank our panel uh, for a very interesting session. Made me think uh, about a lot more things. And I'm, I can't let it go by without talking about it. Is Tom, your counselors that are here to help you, wonderful, just wonderful. And thank you for being the support for him. We appreciate that. To uh, all of you, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm supposed to remind you that there's a uh, party tonight. <laughs> it's a hospitality night, OK. And it's over at the Radisson Hotel, right? So, and it starts at uh, 8 o'clock. OK. Like to see you all there. Uh, before we close, I've got a, um, a thank you card to, to present to our presenters. Uh, it's uh, in recognition. Uh, the SUMA will be making a donation to the Mike Baddams Scholarship Fund. I got right that right, Mike. Yeah. When I asked the gals before, I, I said John Batham, who was Mike's brother. Anyway, both those kids grew up when I was recreation director in Nest in uh, Weyburn, and um, they came up through the ranks. And uh, so I've known them since they were little wee guys. And uh, it's it's interesting that uh, how this happens, but. Uh, the, the re recognition here is for your contribution to us today at this session and recognizing there will be a contribution made on your behalf to the Mike Batham Scholarship Fund. Okay, I'll call the meeting to an end and thank you all again for coming. We appreciate it very much.